Hey, welcome in folks. Chris Temple here, editor and publisher of the National Investor. And also again, a special guest today uh, in just a second will be mm -hmm. Phil Flynn. Uh, he's going to be joining us at the Strategic Investment Insights Conference in Chicago and not too many days hence on the 6th and 7th of May. Here you see the website for the conference on the screen. I urge you to register. Uh, come if you can. If you can't physically make it, register anyway because that will give you access to our panel discussions. It will give you access to all the companies that will be there exhibiting. And look, as we've been saying for a while in a series of videos, introducing our guests and our panelists ahead of time, this is an epical time for uh, the world, really, and for the US economy. There's things being unleashed that we literally have never lived through before. And some as inflation, we're gonna talk about with Phil, uh, having to do a lot with the spike in energy prices. Uh, Phil Flynn is the uh, senior market analyst uh, for the Price Futures Group in the Chicagoland area. Uh, the other day I talked about Scott Melby and bragged on him as a uranium expert. Here's our go-to guy, <laughs> folks, for the uh, oil and gas markets and all things energy. Phil, thanks for coming on today. It's great to be here, especially at such a critical time for energy, probably the most critical we've seen um, at least since the 1970s. Well, folks, if you've not seen Phil before, you don't watch much business television. He's a regular on Fox Business News. In fact, this weekend uh, you were on with Neil Cavuto. I saw Phil on Fox News generally on the weekend. Yeah, um, I'm a contributor. I've been with them for a lot of years and, uh, you know, uh, the power to prosper. That's the place to be. Yep. And, and you've also got your own blog. You've got your own newsletter that we put up on the screen. Folks, you need to look up Phil again. You, you, you want to be with smart people, especially when you've got the changes going on like we are here. But I want to start first off real quick, Phil, with the crude oil market. You know, it's always been historically volatile. I remember back right before mm -hmm. the bust in 2008, it only was seven or eight months, something like that, where we had $140 oil and then crashed down near 30 more recently, it was scarcely two years ago that we had a negative spot price for crude when demand collapsed at the beginning of COVID and all the lockdowns. And now here we are back at triple digits and wondering if we're, this is going to be something we're going to live with for a long time. So you know, give us your sense of how much of this is structural, how much is financial. Is there any near-term hope that we're going to see any relief to these prices? I don't think so. You know, I think we're in a super cycle for oil. And I think it's a super cycle that probably started, you know, before oil went to zero, believe it or not. Um, you know, and, and, you know, looking at the history of oil from, you know, the days of whale oil, this has been a boom and bust market forever. Uh, and we had our bust, we had a double bust, you know, because of COVID. Um, but it underlies the, you know, the situation where the world takes oil and gas for granted. You know, they think we're going to be on alternative energies in a few years. You know, uh, it's kind of funny. It's just, you know, two years ago when oil was at zero, I was hearing people predict demand has peaked out. We'll never see demand hit, you know, these levels again. So oil prices are doomed to stay low forever. You know, that's a kind of a flip from where we were, you know, a couple of decades ago. Well, the world's running out of oil. It's going to be Mad Max. Everybody's fighting for the last barrel of oil. That's it. You know, so that goes to show you the global oil market. You can never say never because as soon as yeah. you say that, the market proves you wrong. You never say never about anything. I, I want to just inject something that's a pet peeve of mine, as you know, and that is the Fed. If we can go back to the 1970s. And in retrospect, in nearly half a century on, people are starting to admit this. Arthur Burns, who was Nixon's Fed chairman, actually made things worse because he kept interest rates too low, the dollar too cheap, in the name of saving the economy from the shock of the Arab oil embargo. And all he did was add to the shock because that cheap money policy drove up the oil price. And maybe this is a little too hokey to ask you to put a percentage on this, Phil, but on a scale of zero to 100, I'll try this. How much uh, on a scale of zero to 100 of the Fed's uh, actions have contributed to the price going up with Jerome Powell doing the same thing that Arthur Burns did almost half a century ago? I think there's no doubt about it. You know, percentage wise, I would say 30, 40 percent. But, but in the past, the Federal Reserve has had more impact on the price of oil. You know, in fact, if you look back in recent years, the biggest impact the Fed had on oil, almost a direct relationship was after, um, you know, um, the financial crisis. 
Uh, if you remember when Ben Bernanke started to print money, quantitative right. easing, we had a one-to-one -one relationship basically on what the dollar would do or versus oil because there was nothing else going on in the economy at that time except for the Fed printing money, right? Because everything had shut down. Uh, I think more recently, the Federal Reserve has added to inflationary pressures, right? They've kept interest rates low. There's a lot of money in the market. We're using more oil. We're, we're using more goods. And that's a big percentage of it. Um, and But when you add to that, there have been structural issues on the supply side that I've been warning about for years, you know, uh, I, you know, I, it's kind of funny because a couple of years ago, everybody said, shell revolution, you know, I hear, I heard oil analysts say oil will never trade above $30 a barrel because as soon as they do, the shell guys will come on and push oil back down, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and, and that was a false assumption, not understanding how shell works, right? Because you have to continue to invest in money. It's not like drilling wells in Saudi Arabia that might run for 70 to 100 years, you know, it's a constant cash infusion uh, and it has a huge decline rate where traditional wells don't. And, and so I saw this rush of money where the big oil companies were moving away from the more expensive projects, looking for the quick buck, uh, that left us underinvested and we're starting to see the impact of that underinvestment right now. So with oil truly, Phil, it's it's a matter of underinvestment that that's, has the same dynamic that's caused copper to go up, lithium to go up, nickel, uranium, all of them. It, it's no different than oil, despite what some had said before. It is. And, you know, I, I'll tell you, we went through this period of low commodity prices for years uh, and the underinvestment always comes. And it, it is the bigger cycle, right? We've seen it in the commodity sector, you know, zinc, copper for years and generations. Uh, and I think this cycle had been hurt more by, you know, the Federal Reserve. But, you know, we also had innovation that I think extended the cycle, right? I mean, when you talk about, we mentioned the shale revolution and technology, um, you know, I thought it was amazing because, you know, a few years ago, the Federal Reserve was like, we don't get it. We're not seeing inflation. Why are we not seeing inflation? We, we, we got to get inflation up to 2%. Well, we did have historic disinflationary and pressures, but they still couldn't understand, you know, we're, we're lowering interest rates to zero or negative zero when you include quantitative varying, but we can't get inflation up. Well, it was because of the U.S. energy producers. They changed the rules of the ball game for a lot of years. They were the reason for disinflation because they were so innovative. They, they created supply where they said there couldn't be that kept, kept inflation low. Uh, and what happens when you get low prices, people take it for granted. They're like, oh, you know, it's just going to come on really easy. You know, we got this all solved. Guess what happens? All of a sudden you take it for granted. You know, everybody says, all right, let's forget about oil. We can do windmills now. You know, we can do, you know, all this other stuff and replace that. And then all of a sudden, boom, reality hits. And then I think we're getting a little taste of reality right now. Oh, for sure. Now, the president going into this last Easter weekend, Phil, as you know, announced that he was going to open up 140 some thousand acres of federal land to new oil and gas leases. Uh, that's a small percentage, apparently, of the initial size of the package that was bandied about. But what does that really mean? I mean, we've got, you know, he says that out of one side of his mouth, but then he's got a Treasury secretary who has made it a, a trendy issue. Mm -hmm. among the woke and among the environmentalists and so forth to punish people who invest in these things uh, these days. Anybody that invests in fossil fuels, you know, you're, you're going to be on the edge of the room at best at the cocktail party for these people if you even get allowed into the party. Mm -hmm. So is this going to mean anything that he's opening up more land? It means that he broke a campaign promise, right? Yeah. Didn't he tell everybody on the campaign trail, oh, I'm going to ban federal drilling. And, you know, so far he's been pretty successful at that, right? I mean, it's, it, at this point in his presidency, we've had less drilling leases than any other president in recent history. And now all of a sudden, because the poll numbers are below 30% and people are angry saying, your policies are idiotic. You're, you're breaking the middle class, you're breaking the poor, gasoline prices hit historic high prices, and, and you're telling me you're not going to drill on federal lands? And look at what's happening in the natural gas. We saw natural gas prices hit the highest level since 2008. Does he realize, the president, that 15% of our supply comes off federal lands, and that supply every day is declining, so if you're not drilling more, your supplies are going down, so we have the lowest storage we've had after winter that we've had in three years, but yet 
the president is really generous with our supply saying, hey, we'll send it to Europe, guys, to help right. you out. You know, what are you thinking here? You, you're dissuading us from producing here. Then you're promising it to other countries. Listen, I know you hate the oil and gas industry, but then when you get into a jam, then you come to the oil and gas industry to save your butt. I mean, this is the disjointed energy policy that we're getting. And it's amazing to me that one president who supposedly has no control over prices can do so much damage in one year. But we all saw it coming. And I think, you know, we feel it every time we pay our bills for heating and when yeah. we fill up at the gas pump. Well, you know, North America has, is blessed with probably the best and the most efficient natural gas resources on the planet, maybe Absolutely. even more than Russia. Absolutely. Uh, because it's more efficient. And we have surrendered that, as you've pointed out, in, in sending these resources to Europe to bail them out of a political mess, which should never have happened. Whole different story we're not going to get into today. And, and now, again, people are going to pay for it. And that, that, to me, is also remarkable, Phil, because there's on and off for several years when you did have the shale boom with uh, oil production, there were some markets, producers couldn't give the excess gas away. They'd burn it off. You couldn't sell it in New York. Half of Canada couldn't sell their gas for anything. Right, right. And, and so here again, we've got a situation. Is this going to be something chronic? Are we going to go back to, when was it that, that natural gas was in double digits? When did that? Uh, that was about 2008. We're, we're, yeah. get, we're headed back there again, right? I mean, so not that far far away. We're getting close to those levels again. You know, and, you know, the way things are going, we're not going to have enough energy to power our, our, our cryptocurrency money. That's going to be horrible. Just well, you know, <laughs> I, I've said for a while yeah, right. that, that we, we are in a new energy crisis. We've got yeah. leaders, and we use the term loosely, of course, who have screwed up almost everything they've touched. They're hampering the traditional fossil fuel industry, causing prices to spike, speaking out of both sides of their mouth, while at the same time, when they claim they want to replace everything with uh, electric vehicles, they're stopping or shutting down battery metals projects in the U.S. So is it really going to take the Democrats getting annihilated in the midterms this year? Is it going to take gas prices like in Europe? for an extended time to get people to wake up and throw the bums out and have someone come in and do this right, Phil? I think so. I mean, that's got to be it because this administration has no clue when it comes to energy. You know, they, they have a philosophy that, you know, energy just, you know, comes from the sun and that's all there is to it and everything's yeah. free and wonderful. Uh, but the reality is they have nobody with any oil and gas experience in their entire administration. That's part of the problem. OK, and they're getting their advice from the green energy lobby, the guys that are getting billions of dollars of taxpayer money all around the world, you know, for this green energy transition. So they, sh the, the, you know, the money is driving their policy. But the reality is, is that green energy isn't ready for prime time, folks. I'm sorry. There's not enough wind. We can't scale enough wind farms in the world. We can't even think about what to do with the used wind turbines because, you know, they end up in a, in a garbage dump. You know, you talk about uh, electric cars. Well, that sounds wonderful, but it's less efficient. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to power. We're going to have to redo the power grid. You know, I think the funniest uh, thing I saw was a an electric power station that was powered by a diesel uh, truck. <laughs> you know, I mean. I mean, you know, it, listen, it, listen, I'm an everything and above guy. Listen, I love electric cars. I own Tesla, the stock. I love it. OK, I, I think they're cool. But it, it, are they ready for prime time to take over the economy? No. Why? They're not efficient enough. Right. You know, uh, does, it, does everybody in the economy? I mean, it's going to turn to siesta day. All right. Everybody stop working. We got to charge our cars. You know, everybody pull over. You know, come on. I mean, this, you know, you're replacing, you know, in economics, you're supposed to replace technology that improves it, right? And right. I understand there's other challenges, you know, with the environment. I get it, you know, and there's room for diversification, you know, but this forget about fossil fuels and go all, you know, green energy when, when you're throwing billions of dollars at stuff that theoretically doesn't work doesn't make sense that's not good for the economy and we're already feeling that pain now when you demonize investment in fossil fuels on top of it that makes it even worse you know now we're you know it's not even about the reality of supplies and demand it's about you know who do you like 
you know, who is worthy to get your dollars and who isn't. And when you start making economic decisions like that, it leads to economic disaster. And that's why we're facing that, what we're facing right now. Well, and that's one of the remarkable and mind numbing really parts of this, Phil, is that you've got policymakers who, as we said a minute ago, they penalize companies for, for, for putting money into uh, oil and gas and coal and whatnot. It's just, it's just, it's just nuts. Uh, you know, parting shot, if you could be king for a day or maybe it would take a week. All right. Give us a cliff notes version of what you think needs to be done. If we were to follow, for example, Jamie Dimon's uh, recent uh, pr public pronouncement and say, we need something on the order of a Marshall plan to get our act together on all of this. We need to do it yesterday. What would Phil Flynn's plan be? I'd agree with them. You know, I think reverse, first of all, reverse the Biden administration policies that, that have discouraged U.S. oil and gas production. Listen, U.S. oil and gas production is the cleanest in the world, okay? President Biden, his policy has made the world a dirtier place. Yeah. And even worse than that, I think that energy policy, this green energy policy in Europe has, has, has helped give Vladimir Putin more power over the region and, and, and has led to war. I, I call this the first you know, war of the Green New Deal, right? Uh, you really know, everybody, everybody is telling me the biggest threat to you know climate change can cause regional instability. The answer is no, it doesn't. It's it's the green energy transition that is causing the disruptions in the world. So you know, first of all, I'd get back to reality. I would go back to the U.S. Energy and say, listen. I know you're going to be here for the next 25 to 50 years. What can you do to raise production immediately? What can we do to get out of your way? We need reasonable environmental laws. You know, it shouldn't take longer to approve in a pipeline than it takes to build it, right? Or five times longer. I mean, you know, listen, we know the technology. Um, and, and I would go to a Marshall Plan, USA, oil and gas and green energy. Let's get together. Let's work together. Let's make America the major producer in the world. And I'll tell you what, that would have dissuaded Vladimir Putin more than you know any other sanction we could give him. If the U.S. oil producers produce more oil and gas, that's what they fear because Putin knows the reason why he's getting away with what he's getting away with so far in Ukraine is, is because they can't cut off his oil and gas supply. He right. knows it. He knows it. Right. Yeah. So, so let's take that away from him. Let's do this. I'm all for exporting to Europe, but let's do it in a big way, not per piecemeal. Let's make it a long term policy as opposed to some short term policy to respond to falling poll ratings. Yeah. Well, good stuff. And it's sad that that is what's driving policy. And we'll, we can only hope for a good outcome in the midterms and some more sanity. Phil, I really appreciate the time today, folks. As you can tell, listening to Phil, you're in for a heck of a treat. On uh, Specifically, the 7th of May, Phil is going to be on our energy and policy panel. He's our guy on uh, conventional energy or the old energy economy, if you will, which is still very much here and very important, as you've heard. So, Phil, thanks much, buddy. Thank and I'm you. going to look forward to seeing you shortly. I'll see you there. Thanks, Chris. See you, everybody.